Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's nice to see everyone. Um, uh, so a couple things uh, just generally say at the start of every talk, uh, please ask questions. The more questions, the better. If you don't ask questions, I'll end up speeding up and then I'll feel good about how much material I covered. Uh, but halfway through, you'll all be like, you know, checking your texts or whatever, and, and it will be a big waste of all of our time. So please ask questions. Uh, okay, so I'm going to talk about mean curvature flow in high co-dimension today. Or at least I think I will. Okay, so um, uh, uh, all the work that I talk about to, uh, will be joint work with Toby Colding. Uh, a couple of um, general themes. Uh, the first thing is that uh, mean curvature flow has, has largely, uh, mostly been studied in co-dimension one. So uh, we'd like to understand what happens when the co-dimension gets high. Uh, much, much less is known. This is parallel in many ways to the situation for uh, minimal submanifolds. Um, if you're in, suppose you have some, an area minimizing hypersurface, uh, if it's a hypersurface that then uh, you know that it's gonna be regular up to uh, some singular set that's much, much smaller, you know, co-dimension seven. So um, that's, uh, you know, a, a really small set. Uh, but once you allow higher co-dimension, um, then you have the, the whole Omgren theory. Um, and so now the singular set is larger, much, much less is known, many more things can happen. Um, the situation is in some sense uh, more, is, is more difficult and in some sense more interesting. Uh, okay, so one of the things, so, so what's gonna be the, uh, the main thing that we're gonna use to get a handle on these things? We're gonna use some ideas from function theory. So um, in a way, this is a little bit similar to um, how you might think of, of, of some questions in algebraic or complex geometry. You have these complicated spaces. Uh, they're very nonlinear. It's hard to, to really describe uh, too much what's going on, but you have a, some very nice functions on these spaces or maybe sections of line bundles. And if you understand pretty well how these, uh, you know, what goes on with these, how large the spaces are, how they behave, you can then say a whole lot about the space you are studying to begin with. Okay, so that's gonna be the general philosophy. A lot of the things that we'll do from function theory are actually inspired um, or can be thought of as, as parabolic analogs of things that were done for harmonic functions uh, that Toby and I looked at as well as many other people um, now an awfully long time ago, maybe say the uh, early 90s or so, early to mid 90s. Okay, so I'd like to give an idea on the general flavor of the results. So I'll give sort of meta theorems right now um, and, and try to just give an idea where we're heading. They're gonna be sort of two strands of these. So the first strand is that we're gonna have one of these uh, mean curvature flows in some very large dimensional space. And we'd like to try and say it actually lies in a much smaller space. Okay, so we'd like to say this flow that, that had all these possible degrees of freedom really had far fewer, which is uh, one way to say that is that say, uh, you know, it's sitting in a Euclidean space. So one thing you could say is, well, in fact, you don't need all of the coordinates to describe it. Many of these are uh, related by linear relations. And so in fact, it lies in a much smaller dimensional linear subspace. Okay, so that's gonna be the first strand of results. So how are we gonna estimate this, 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 uh, the dimension of this linear subspace? Uh, the invariant that we'll show to be important is something called the entropy. And so this is some measure of the complexity and I'll define it in a, a few slides later. Uh, and so as one consequence of this, we'll see that there are cases where you can get bounds on the, uh, the co-dimension of uh, a generic singularity. So, and again, more, more later as, we, as I define some of these things, but that's the first, oops. Okay, so now that's one strand of results. The second strand of results, we'll see in some instances, you can actually give absolutely sharp bounds on the co-dimension. So some uh, mean curvature flow that, you know, so I'll give an example. Suppose you had a, a surface and it was flowing in some, you know, say eight dimensional Euclidean space. There'll be certain cases where we can say that that surface actually lies in a three-dimensional subspace. So that's absolutely sharp. You're not gonna get any better than that unless it happens itself to be linear. Okay, and so this is something, again, um, right? So this is uh, not something you can do in general. You're gonna, I mean, it's gonna have to happen because there's some strong information that you have. In this case, the strong information will be some information about what the flow looks like at minus infinity. Some idea of the asymptotic structure as you look backwards in time. 
one consequence of this is that we'll prove a rigidity theorem for cylinders. So we'll, we'll see why cylinders are so important, but a rigidity uh, theorem for cylinders in all dimension and co-dimension. Okay, so now let me, I'll, I'll take a couple slides just to remind you a little bit about mean curvature flow. And so I've drawn the flow for a curve evolving in the plane, but remember that we're thinking about a, uh, an n-dimensional submanifold evolving in some large capital n-dimensional space. So at each point, the submanifold has a mean curvature vector, and um, this vector is, is measuring. Um, so the size of the vector measures how large the mean curvature is, and the direction. The vector is normal. It's inward pointing at places where it, it looks convex, and it's outward pointing at places it looks concave. So here's a, a little picture of a curve in the plane. Uh, the red arrows are supposed to uh, be the, the mean curvature vector where it's, it's and showing you where it's about to evolve. Okay, so, that, so that's the mean curvature at each point. And now given some initial thing, we just start evolving it at, um, and it moves over time in the normal direction with speed equal to the mean curvature. This is a geometric heat equation. So it's best understood uh, for curves in the plane where the flow is, is usually called the curve shortening flow where we uh, understand it most of all is in the case of a convex closed curve. So uh, the, the picture that you see here, the outermost curve is the uh, initial time of the flow. And now the convexity is preserved. So what happens is these curves move inwards and as they move inwards, they become more and more round. So in the 80s, Gage and Hamilton showed that if you started with a simple closed convex curve, it remained smooth under the flow, remained convex, didn't cross itself uh, until it disappeared at a point. And if you were to look at this point, then just before it disappeared, uh, it would look almost round. So what that would mean, one way to make that precise is uh, the set is becoming very small. If you look at, at, a, uh, at a time near when it, become, when it disappears, which is we call becoming extinct, you have a small curve. If you magnify that curve so that it contains area pi, then the curve that you get looks almost like a unit circle. If you were to go closer in time to extinction, it would be a smaller curve, magnified area pi again, and now it's even closer to a circle. Okay, so uh, this is often summarized by saying that it disappears at a round point. So uh, uh, Gerhard Huisken showed that the same thing happened in higher dimensions. So if you have a, a closed convex hypersurface, then it, it remains that way and disappears at a point. And if you look at it just before it disappears, it looks almost like a sphere of the appropriate dimension. One thing that's interesting is the Gage Hamilton proof only worked for curves and the Huisken proof only worked for dimensions at least, uh, at least surfaces. It didn't work for curves. The reason is, so, so this thing about it becoming round um, they use different characterizations of round. Gage and Hamilton showed that it, it approached the optimal isoparametric ratio, whereas Gerhard showed that it became umbilic. So Gerhard showed that the, the principal curvatures all were going together to the same value. So this is very similar to, to um, and, and in fact, the argument was inspired by uh, Hamilton's work on Ricci flow in three dimensions. Okay, so there's some matrix maximum principle lurking behind this. Uh, of course, umbilic doesn't mean very much if you have a curve. There's only one eigenvalue of the second fundamental form, so saying it's equal to itself doesn't mean anything. But for uh, surfaces and above, that does become meaningful. Okay, so, so that's the situation for convex hypersurfaces is well understood. So let's leave the, uh, the, con the uh, convex world. Um, and so here I I'll show you a flow of an example, which is uh, mean convex. This is known as the marriage ring. So it's this torus of revolution. You didn't and, tell Toby that this is called a wedding ring in English? <laughs> well, uh, I don't even think Europeans get married, so I'm not sure he'd understand. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, so this is the, uh, yeah. So actually, who did coin this? Um, not sure. So the, uh, yeah, so, so the marriage ring, uh, this, the symmetry is preserved under the flow uh, and so what you see is, is when it becomes singular, it's, it's not gonna become singular at a point. Instead, it becomes singular along a circle. So this flows, there's only that, uh, because uh, it's easy to, to analyze this. And, and in fact, 
um, rotationally symmetric flows were analyzed in detail by uh, Altshuler, uh, Anganet, um, and, 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 and um, Altshuler, uh, Anganet, and uh, gosh, Grace, no, I'm, anyway, I'm blanking, I'm sorry, AAG, uh, and, the, and also Sonar and Suganides. Um, okay, so, uh, right, okay, so this is the first singularity. If you were to zoom in on one of these singularities just before it disappeared, so you look at, look at the circle where the singularities are happening and you magnify that, what you would see would look very much like a cylinder. Okay, so this is um, very much like the old one dimensional example of the collapsing circle crossed with a line. Okay, so the way that we understand singularities in Ricci flow is we do a blowing up process. So we magnify near the singularity. And as we do, because of the parabolic nature of the problem, if you magnify the picture, you also have to magnify time. Okay, so um, Hamilton talks about, you know, you think of the Ricci flow as being like a movie and you wanna zoom in and also go to slow motion. Okay, and so that gives you a, a new flow. As you do this, because you're magnifying time, you're stretching out time also, the new flow that you get goes further back in time. And so you do as an increasing sequence of magnifications, as you zoom in on that singularity, you extract a, a, a subsequence that converges to some limiting flow. That limiting flow is defined all the way to time minus infinity. Flows like that are called ancient and they have much better regularity properties. So remember that the, uh, this flow is a geometric heat equation. So it has some sort of smoothing properties that are inherent in all heat equations. So a flow that has been uh, evolving continuously getting smoother like this for an infinite amount of time, you expect to, be, to have some special properties. Okay, and so these ancient solutions, understanding these is in many ways one of the key points to understanding what happens or what is, what is the, an, any flow look like near a singularity. Okay, so uh, as we do this, as we zoom in, we have a freedom to, to vary the point that we're zooming at. Um, and, and that in general, if, if you do that, you produce just an ancient flow. If you fix the point and zoom in on that fixed point, uh, then it turns out that the the, the uh, ancient flow that you you produce has a self similar property it ends up being invariant under parabolic dilations, and so these are a special type of flow called a shrinker. They evolve by scaling. It's an example of a soliton for the for the system. Um, what you should think of is this: this is kind of like a parabolic parabolic analog of a cone. Um, and so, if you're doing a a tangent flow a tangent cone analysis for minimal submanifolds, if you zoom in on a point and you do the blow up, uh, then you produce a, a minimal submanifold that's invariant under dilation, which is a, called a minimal cone. And this cone, in order to understand a cone, all you need to understand is the link. If you intersect with a sphere, right, all of that, the, the, what you see there is enough to recover the entire cone because you just take the cone over that link. In the minimal case, that link is a minimal submanifold of a sphere. In the shrinker case here, um, our, our analog of taking the link is we, enter, we look at the time minus one slice, which recovers everything. And, and so that is now an elliptic thing. Uh, it satisfies this elliptic equation, which is similar to the minimal surface equation. It's that the, minimal, the mean curvature is equal to x perp over two, where x is the, the position vector. Okay, so these are the analogs of the links. These are like minimal submanifolds and spheres. Understanding these things will tell us a lot about the possible uh, singularities that could arise. Okay, so let's see some examples of these things. And, re and remember that these, um, these shrinkers, these are one type of example of an ancient flow, uh, but there, of course there are many others. A and understanding um, you know, the different aspects of the singularity analysis are, uh, require understanding different aspects of the, of the ancient flows. Uh, so there's the, this, the first, well, of course there's a trivial example, but the first interesting examples of shrinkers are round cylinders. Uh, the sphere is one, that's one extreme. So here it's, I've, I did an SK cross R N minus K. Uh, so when K is equal to N, uh, then, then you get the, a sphere. Um, but of course you could have all these intermediate dimensions as well. So these product things. These turn out in, in a number of ways to be the most important uh, shrinkers to understand. So, um, the, uh, there's one way, so the, the shrinker S1 cross R N minus one is the most important to understand in, in all dimensions. And that can be seen because of, um, 
basic geometric measure theory, the Omgren Federer dimension reducing, which was extended to the parabolic problem by Brian White. Okay, so um, when you do these tangent cone analysis, there's a stratification of the singular set. The highest dimensional part of the singular set uh, are the places where the, the blowups have the, the largest translation invariance. And so in this case, that means cylinders. Could you comment on the normalization of the radius of the sphere? Yeah, great point. Okay, so this is the one that, that, that's required to, uh, so that it satisfy the, uh, the Schrinker equation. Remember we have H is, I'll go back a slide, H is X perp over two. Uh -huh. And so the more dimensions of the sphere, the more principal curvatures you have. So the higher the mean curvature got would be for the, the same radius. And so that's reflect, reflected in here um, that, yeah, the, the uh, so, right. So the radius uh, varies with the dimension. Basically all of these spheres are collapsing at different rates. And that's because if you have more, uh, if the sphere has, ha has higher dimensions, there are more principal curvatures. So the curvature is larger, it's collapsing more quickly. And so that's where that comes in. Okay, so, um, so that's why, so in all co-dimension, in all dimension and all co-dimension, we're most interested in the cylinders because of this dimension reducing. These characterize the highest dimensional part of the singular set. Okay, so in co-dimension one, there are three additional reasons why the cylinders are the most interesting singularities. The first are they're the only mean convex ones. So Gerhard proved this in a, a couple papers in 1990 and 1993 um, for, for the case of type one blowups. So that's where you assume some, some rate uh, at the singularity, which is to say that the, the shrinker itself has bounded curvature, bounded second fundamental form. Um, Toby and I removed that assumption on the bounded second fundamental form because we were interested in things where, where we didn't know the blow up rate. And so we were able to show that even without that, you still were able to, to, to get the, uh, the classification. The, the second thing is that these are the ones that are generic. So in this talk, I won't give you a precise, a precise enough definition of generic. Let me just say that right now, the definition of generic, um, think of it as meaning uh, stable under perturbation. Uh, there are many different ways you could formulate this. The way that I would eventually love to formulate it would be that if you could uh, wiggle the initial hypersurface, only the generic ones wouldn't disappear. Okay, we don't yet know this strongest form of generic. Okay, rather, what we say is if you're near such a singularity um, that, that isn't on this list, then, uh, you, then you could wiggle it and this singularity will never reappear under the flow. Okay, that's a similar, but not, not quite the same statement. Okay, the if third- your, your flow, uh, if your background rather than being Euclidean space is some other Riemannian manifold, then presumably you get the same classification just because this happens at a very tiny scale and you blow out and... Exactly, yep, that's, that, that, that's right. So from the singularity point of view, every manifold is, Ramon, is Euclidean. Because once you do the blow up, uh, then in the limit, as long as the manifold had any reasonable control at all, uh, then it would uh, blow away to a Euclidean space. And so you would end up with a flow in Euclidean space. So, um, Right, so the second reason uh, that, that we love cylinders uh, are, uh, well, I just mentioned the generic. The third reason is they're the only ones with genus zero. So uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Brendel proved uh, Tom Ilmanen's genus zero conjecture showing that uh, if you had a shrinker uh, in R3 of genus zero, then it could only be a, 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 you know, a basically a sphere or a cylinder. Uh, okay, and, and by the way, uh, Brian White showed that there's some uh, topological uh, monotonicity under mean curvature flow. So if you were to start with a mean curvature flow that's genus zero, then it would remain genus zero even as it flowed through singularities. So that means that these are the only singularities you're going to see for any flow, for, for any hypersurface that starts off at genus zero. Okay. So I'm, I'm, floss, I'm uh, sort of brushing aside some technical issues. So you should see like there's legalese after some of these statements, but too bad. Okay, so there's a second large class of uh, shrinkers. And, and these are, are ones just in higher co-dimension. If you have a minimal submanifold in a sphere, and again, you have to be careful with the radius of the sphere because of the normalization that, that, that you asked about, Claude, uh, then it's automatically also a shrinker. 
And this makes sense because remember that the spheres themselves are shrinkers. And if you have a minimal guy in there, its mean curvature vector is just the mean curvature vector of the sphere. That's why it's minimal in the sphere. And so it just car gets carried along for the ride. Okay, but what this means is, uh, so minimal surfaces and spheres were once, you know, it, um, a, a really uh, sort of a hot topic. People spend a lot of time constructing these. There are some really interesting families uh, that were constructed by Kalabi, for instance. Uh, there are a lot of these things and there's some interesting behavior that happens. So this gives a, a, a lot of examples to test various hypotheses on. And anything that we prove about shrinkers automatically also applies to any minimal submanifold of a sphere. Okay, so uh, now what's the, uh, what's our angle? So for purposes of this talk, again, I'd like to, I'd like to use the functions, some, some class of some set of functions um, on a mean curvature flow in order to understand the flow. So the link here is that the coordinate functions on a uh, mean curvature flow actually satisfy the heat equation. Okay, so these, um, right, this is very much the analog of if you have a minimal submanifold, the coordinate functions are harmonic on the minimal submanifold. So this is a parabolic analog of that. Of course, now this is a time varying metric. Many of the, many results about solutions of the heat equation, many of the strongest results in particular are proven for metrics that do not depend on time. Okay, having the time varying metric uh, definitely creates some issues. Uh, and of course, the, there's an analog for shrinkers. Um, and so to explain the equation that we see there, I just have to, to remind you about what's, what's called either the drift Laplacian or the ornstein ullenbeck operator. And so this is a second order operator here. I'll, I'll tell you what it is on Euclidean space. Uh, the second order part is the Laplacian, but there's a first order part, which comes from uh, taking the position vector and dotting it with the gradient. So this is the second order. The first order part is like a scaling derivative of the function. And so this operator is self-adjoint um, if you introduce the Gaussian uh, weight to the inner product space. So if you have, uh, if, you multi if you use the weight, which is e to the minus x squared over four, then this, the, this operator L becomes self-adjoint. With respect to this operator, the uh, coordinate functions, of course, coordinate functions are harmonic for the Laplacian, but for the script L operator, they're not. They're eigenfunctions with eigenvalue a half. Uh, by the way, the, on, if you take n equal one and you just look at r, uh, all of the eigenfunctions that are, say, are in the weighted L2 space uh, are of this form. Okay, they're polynomials. And the degree of the polynomial is uh, twice the eigenvalue. And these polynomials are, are, are known as the Hermite polynomials. Okay, they're important, uh, important in analysis. So uh, now we have a, a script L operator on a shrinker. And so it's, it's built similarly. We take the Laplacian and the first order part. Now, instead of taking um, the position vector field, we just take its tangential part. We project it down onto the shrinker. And so that, this comes from the scaling, a scaling operator on the, on the a scaling map on the shrinker. This is self, uh, again, a self adjoint. And um, it's easy to see from the shrinker equation that uh, the coordinate functions on a shrinker are, are eigenfunctions with eigenvalue a half, okay, just as they were on Euclidean space. Of course, Euclidean space is a trivial example of a shrinker. It's invariant under the flow and also under scaling. Okay, so I'm gonna use this fact um, to, to, um, to handle a toy problem. So let's suppose we have a shrinking curve uh, and it's now in Rn for n is large. So this is a one dimensional solution of the shrinker equation. And it, it lies in some huge Euclidean space. The shrinking curves were classified uh, in the plane. So this was done by Abresch and Langer um, in the mid eighties. And so there's this uh, big list of them. They basically look like the um, uh, you know, the, the, the polar coordinate problems that give your calculus students nightmares. So they circle around several times, you get all these loops and they close up. They're locally convex, um, but because they cross themselves, they're not, not convex curves. So that's what you get in the plane. You could imagine that now that you're, you allow the, the arbitrary co-dimension, there may be huge new families of interesting shrinking curves. 
It turns out that they're not. Every shrinking curve actually lies in a two-dimensional plane. So it's just given by one of the abresch langer solutions um, in the ordinary plane and then just rotate the plane. That, that's all you can get. And so now let me give you a function theory proof of why. So the coordinate functions, we just said they're uh, eigenfunctions for the script L operator. The script L operator is this second order ODE on the shrinker. Okay, so all of these, every coordinate function satisfies the same second order ODE. But the it's a second order ODE. There's only a two dimensional space of solutions. Okay, so uh, now you, you see that, uh, but what does that mean? That means all of these coordinate functions, only two of them are linearly independent. The rest are, can all be written in terms of those. That means that in fact, the shrinker lies in a two dimensional plane. Okay, so we would like to do something like this in arbitrary dimensions. That would be a great theorem. If you have any shrinker, any two dimensional shrinker in Rn, it really lies in R3. Unfortunately, that's not true, but uh, can we at least get some bound on the dimension of the space it lies in, in this way? Of course, OD, there are many fewer solutions to ODEs than there are to PDEs. So that's something, you know, we're gonna have to use something in order to do that. Okay, so let me, um, so, okay, so let's up it to PDEs a little bit. We'll start with the Laplacian. So let me remind you, um, so the classical Louisville theorem, if you have a bounded harmonic function on Euclidean space, in fact, even just a positive harmonic function, then it has to be constant. And in the early 70s, uh, Yao generalized this to manifolds with non-negative Ricci curvature. Okay, so the Louisville theorem holds in that context. So let's, uh, now I'm gonna do like a, a stronger version of the Louisville theorem. So instead of asking that it be bounded, I'm now gonna allow it, the harmonic functions to grow a little bit, but just polynomially. Um, and then I'm gonna let D be the, the rate of growth, the polynomial rate of growth. And so the space HD, these are all the harmonic functions uh, that grow polynomially of degree at most D. So here this, uh, which means the soup on the ball of radius R is bounded by a constant times uh, R to the D. And that has to hold for all R. On Euclidean space, this is enough to say that, that any such function is actually a uh, polynomial. So it's a harmonic polynomial. And, and on Euclidean space, this is, it basically follows from the gradient estimate. If you, uh, the gradient estimate tells you that the derivatives of a harmonic function grow uh, one degree less. And so if you iterate this enough times because the derivatives themselves, the partials themselves on Euclidean space, those are still harmonic. So if you iterate this enough times, you get down to the Louisville theorem. And so that means if you take enough derivatives of a harmonic function that grows polynomial in Euclidean space, you get zero, integrating that back up says it's just a polynomial. Okay, so it's on, on Rn, it's simple. Of course, what this requires is that the, the partial derivative commutes with the Laplacian. Okay, that's not gonna hold on general on a manifold. Okay, so um, Yao uh, conjecture in the Yao conjectured that this uh, that the this Louisville stronger Louisville property held with non-negative Ricci curvature. So the, these spaces uh, should be finite dimensional on any manifold with non-negative Ricci curvature for each d. Uh, in, not, in a paper in '97, Toby and I showed that that's true. Uh, that in fact, the dimension of H d is bounded by a constant times d to the n minus one, and that power n minus one that's sharp on Euclidean space. Okay, so it's easy to check that that's the sharp rate of growth. The constant is not sharp. Uh, and in fact, Harold Donnelly later constructed examples of manifolds uh, where the constant that you would get was larger than Euclidean space. So in other words, it would not be correct to say dimension of HD of MN less equal to dimension of HD of RN. That's not true. Okay, so, and in fact, um, we showed that, that Ricci curvature wasn't necessary, but you could get, uh, get by with two weaker properties, a volume doubling bound and a scale invariant Poincaré inequality. Uh, both of these hold for Ricci curvature, but uh, they, they have the advantage of, of being, um, they're lower regularity conditions and they're more flexible. So for instance, if you were to take a manifold of non-negative Ricci curvature and then uh, make a by Lipschitz change of metric, that would no longer necessarily have non-negative Ricci curvature, but it would still have a volume doubling bound 
and a scale invariant Poincaré. So therefore, um, by our theorem, the space of harmonic functions of polynomial growth uh, would be finite dimensional. Okay, so that result was not, before our theorem was not even known on Rn. So it was not known whether um, on Rn, if you had a metric that was uniformly equivalent to the Euclidean metric, whether or not the spaces of harmonic functions of, of polynomial growth were finite dimensional. There, was, there were a couple of results along that direction. Um, one was by uh, uh, Moser and Struve. They showed it was true if you assumed periodicity. So if you took a metric on the torus um, that, then you could, and lifted it to, to Rn, then you could get finite dimensionality. Okay, so I, there was a, a lot of prior work on this problem. And so I wanna put a slide crediting some of the people who did that, but in the interest of time, I'm going to keep moving. Um, and I should say that this flexibility was useful um, and uh, it was a, a really pretty result of, of Bruce Kleiner where he's able to use uh, things like this uh, to, to give a new proof of Gromov's theorem. And then uh, Shalom and, and, and Tao gave a, uh, an effective version of that. Okay, so uh, for purposes of our talk, we're interested in some heat equation analog of this. So I'm gonna define a space PD. And so these are gonna be uh, caloric functions. So in other words, solutions of the heat equation of polynomial growth. Now, what does that mean here? So if I were to just ask that they grow polynomially in space, that would not be enough to prove anything. And the heat equation is extremely flexible. If you take any, virtually any initial data, um, I mean, they're various, horrendous pathologies that have to be ruled out, but virtually any initial data, then you can solve for the heat equation going forward some say, you know, one unit in time. Um, so for instance, you could take, a, there's not gonna be a Louisville theorem in the same way. If you took a, uh, any bounded function, just absolutely horrific, and then uh, that was positive, um, say, and solve the heat equation one unit in time. Now just alter it however you like, you could get a huge infinite dimensional family of such things. There's, no, there's certainly not constant. So there's gonna to need to be some other condition, which uh, if you want to hope to have some kind of Louisville property, the right condition is that they're ancient. So the solution has to be defined all the way back to time minus infinity. And in this case, we're gonna ask that it remain polynomially bounded back to time minus infinity. So that's this condition right here on the soup. You'll notice that in time, I go to minus r squared, uh, whereas in space, I just go out to radius r. This is the a standard thing that happens in parabolic problems. Time and space scale differently because we're only taking one time derivative in the equation, but two space derivatives. So that has to be compensated for in the scaling. Okay, so have, we have this space of caloric functions of polynomial growth of degree d. Um, okay, it's not hard to see that on Euclidean space, this is finite dimensional. And again, they're polynomials. These are known as the caloric polynomials. And they, um, you know, uh, they, they, uh, when you talk about the degree of a caloric polynomial, you usually count T as being degree two, whereas X is degree one. Uh, and you can see that the dimension of, of this space is on order D to the N. It's easy to see. Just a fun, little fun linear algebra. Okay, so Toby and I showed, um, and this is for a, a, a metric that does not depend on time. Uh, we showed that if, as, as long as you have some sort of polynomial volume growth, uh, then the dimension of these caloric ancient caloric functions of polynomial growth was bounded in terms of the dimension of the harmonic ones. Okay, so um, if you combine this with our earlier result, uh, then you see that if, say, for instance, say if a manifold is non-negative Ricci curvature, um, then the dimension of, of PD is bounded by a constant times D to the N, which is that exponent is sharp on Euclidean space. Okay, so, um, right, so it's interesting. Shortly before we, we proved that, uh, Fang Hua Lin and, and Ku S. Zhang, um, they argued more along the lines of what we originally did for harmonic functions, and they, they obtained the bound D to the N plus one, um, which is, based on, by analogy with our earlier work, d to the n plus one is the bound that I would have guessed. Because if you think about uh, space time under the parabolic scaling, that has dimension n plus two, parabolic dimension n plus two. And so this would be one dimension less than the, the, the parabolic dimension. 
which would be exactly analogous to what we proved for harmonic functions, uh, which is why the sort of arguments that we use for harmonic functions ended up giving this bound. So we were somewhat surprised when we were able to obtain the bound n. Um, we stopped trying to get any better because Euclidean space was already in. But, okay. All right, so how does this, uh, what does this mean for, for what we're doing? So for the mean curvature flow, because the coordinate functions lie in this space P1, the linear functions, the restrictions of the linear functions, they grow only linearly. Uh, if I could get a bound for the number, for the dimension of those as a vector space, then I would have a bound for the, uh, it would be very much like our Tor problem. I could give you a bound for the, the dimension of, a, of a, an affine space that this was contained in, the flow was contained in. Uh, one difficulty is our, the previous result that we did would not apply uh, because that was very much um, geared towards the Laplacians that were not dependent on time. So once the Laplacian and the Laplacian and the T derivative no longer commute, then the, the, the work that, that I just talked about that Toby and I did, as well as the work that Fang Hua and, and Zhang did, um, that no longer works. It does not apply when the, when the metric varies with time. Okay, so I'm gonna um, sort of slowly inch towards the next result. I need to define a few things in order to state it. Uh, it's been, uh, so uh, Claude, I, I do very much appreciate your questions, but it's been a while since you, you had one and I'm seeing more and more uh, you know, cameras off. So I'm worried that I, I, I may be losing touch with uh, my very, uh, the audience I'm very happy to have, but. Uh, yeah, it would actually be a good idea to write down some explicit examples of caloric polynomials so that people realize this is a concrete thing, right? Right, sure. Okay, so um, that's an excellent idea. It's also a great chance to use the board. Um, the only inherent risk it has is anytime in lecture you do something that you didn't uh, prepare in advance, <laughs> there's like a 60 to 75% chance it will start with an error. So let's do this on R. So if I was to do a caloric polynomial on R, remember I want dt minus dx squared of uh, u to equal zero. Okay, so uh, of course, if I just did, okay, so th this is our, our heat operator here. Um, and so how about if I take t, um, C, uh, so T plus one half X squared. And so the second derivative here is gonna give me a, a, a one and a, uh, that, okay. So this is the, the first caloric polynomial, the first non-trivial caloric polynomial. Okay, and so you can keep on going. So if, uh, if you're at degree D, you can get all the way up to, T could get as high as D over two um, and the X's could get all the way up to D. Okay, and so once you're on a, once you're on a flow, um, of course the metric is changing, so we can't do it quite like that. Okay, so the, the thing that we're going to use to, um, to, to control the dimension of these spaces oh, is- Sorry, Bill, Bill yeah. could I ask, uh, what, could you go back a, a slide? You had the uh, volume growth bounded by a power d to the v. Yeah. Yeah, what is, what is d to the v? Uh, oh, it's just a constant. Uh, so as long as the volume grows polynomially, so this is for some dv that the bound ends up not depending on dv. Okay. But there are various places where we need the volume to grow polynomially in order to control things. So dv can be arbitrary, just arbitrary. Yep. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Yep. Thank you for the question. Okay. So uh, right. Okay. So let me uh, just talk a little bit about what this. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give an invariant which um, is something like a volume, but it sees volumes on all scales. Um, so it's, it's more like an, you know, when you talk about uh, measures and you think about Alfors regularity, you might look at comparing the volume of any ball to the volume of a Euclidean ball and look at that ratio. If you know that's bounded for all balls, that gives you some regularity of the, uh, of the measure, which is a useful thing. So we'll do something like that, but instead of looking, instead of varying the ball, I'm going to uh, vary the Gaussian that I integrate. Okay, so, okay, so first... Uh, I'm going to define the Gaussian area where I take the standard Gaussian and I integrate it uh, on a submanifold. Okay, so this e to the minus x squared over four, and then I have this constant in front involving pi. The constant is chosen so that if I take a uh, Euclidean space, an n-dimensional Euclidean space through the origin, uh, then, then the uh, Gaussian area ends up being one. 
Okay, so that's why the strange constant. And of course, this should remind you very much of a heat kernel. Uh, and now I'm going to define the, my invariant, the entropy, is I'm going to take the, uh, the supremum over all Gaussians. And so there are two ways you could do this. You could either vary, in, vary the, the center and scale of the Gaussian, or uh, you could fix the Gaussian and then take your hypersurface, or sorry, take your, your submanifold, and then um, allow all translations and dilations of it. Okay, so that's what I've done. I've, I've expressed this in the second way. So lambda is, I take the standard Gaussian area, but now I, I my initial submanifold, I allow all rescalings and all translations, and I take the supremum over all of that. And so this is seen every point and every scale. And so we call this invariant the entropy. So the first observation uh, is that uh, there, there's a monotonicity formula for um, the Gaussian area in mean curvature flow. Uh, and using this formula, you can see that the entropy is actually non-increasing on a mean curvature flow. So the entropy at any later time is less than the entropy at the initial time. So if you control the entropy of the initial time, you control all uh, future entropies. Notice that because the entropy sees every scale, you also see all entropies of any blowups. So any singularities that you, you produce later in time their complexity, their entropy is bounded by the entropy of the initial submanifold. Okay, so that's the first observation. Uh, the second thing, which is uh, not hard to see, is that if you take, if you look at the entropy of a shrinker, it's actually achieved without any translation or dilation. For a shrinker, the entropy and the F functionals are the same. So you can either see this by a, a, a it follows directly from the monotonicity for a flow, if you think about it. It also can be seen by a direct argument just by differentiating the entropy um, as you change the center and scale. Okay, so the next property of the entropy. Uh, it's easy to see that on Rn, uh, the, well, we already saw the entropy is one on Rn. It's easy to see from that, that if you have any submanifold, the entropy is always at least one. And that's because the entropy sees every scale. So every manifold looks locally Euclidean, so if I just zoom in at that small scale, I can use um, what I got in the Euclidean case, and I see that the entropy is at least one. Um, if you have a shrinker, there's a gap to one. So this is a, um, a, a, follows from work of, uh, in, in, in some instances, from work of Bracke, and it, ex specifically uh, from uh, Brian White's Bracke theorem. So in other words, there's an epsilon regularity theorem here. If you have entropy less than one plus epsilon, it turns out that it has to be a plane if it's a, uh, if it's a shrinker. So the epsilon uh, so does not depend on the, the manifold or? The epsilon, uh, yes. So the epsilon depends on the dimension of the manifold, but only the dimension. So, um, okay, so let me uh, give you a, a sort of a cute fact. So uh, you might ask, what's the, suppose you have a curve in the plane. What's the least, a closed curve, what's the least possible entropy it could have? So for any curve, the, the smallest entropy would be a line and that entropy would be one. If you have a closed curve in the plane though, uh, it turns out that you can't get that close to one. It turns out that in fact, the circle is the smallest entropy you could have. And so this follows, uh, the way to see this is from Grayson's theorem. So you, you let this curve that you have evolve under the curve shortening flow. Um, so first of all, you can assume it's, it's, it's uh, a simple curve. Uh, if, if it crosses itself, the entropy is at least two. I'll skip that argument. Uh, so now the simple closed curve, that disappears at a round point by a combination of Grayson and Gage Hamilton. Because the entropy is monotone, that means the entropy just before it disappears must be below what it was where it started. But just before it disappears, it looks like a circle. So that means the initial entropy was at least that of the circle. So uh, there's, this is such a simple functional. It seems like there should be an obvious way to see that the circle has the, you know, minimizes the entropy. Uh, so in fact, I gave that problem to an undergrad asking for a, 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 a undergrad research uh, um, opportunity or project here. Turns out that uh, they weren't able to solve it. And then as I thought about it, I wasn't able to solve it either. The only proof that I know 
is uh, using the, the curve shortening flow. It, there must be some direct um, proof, but I don't know it. Okay, so that fact in higher dimensions, uh, so Toby and I, uh, together with uh, Tom Millman and Brian White, we showed that the sphere uh, had the least entropy um, at, for hypersurfaces and for, that were shrinkers, for hypersurface shrinkers. And we conjectured that in fact, that should be true for any closed hypersurface. So uh, Jacob Bernstein and Lu Wang uh, proved that conjecture up to dimension six, which is all we conjectured it in because we didn't know what might happen in higher dimensions because of the, the various uh, you know, singularities like the Simons cone. Um, but to my surprise, uh, Jonathan Zhu uh, prove that actually it's true in any dimension. Uh, and at this point, uh, I would also conjecture that it's true in all co-dimension, at least in low dimensions, but uh, that's a great problem. I, there are no, essentially no results on that other than for curves. Okay, so let me uh, state a theorem here. So if you have an ancient mean curvature flow, remember ancient means the flow is defined all the way to time minus infinity. This, these are the flows that, that, that arise in a singularity analysis. Uh, and you have a bound on its entropy, then you get a bound on the dimension of PD. Okay, and so this bound is polynomial, um, so it's in D to the N, and this dependence on D, that's sharp on Euclidean space. Notice this does not follow from um, the theorem that I stated before, because that theorem was for metrics that did not depend on time, and it strongly used the Laplacian and the T derivative commute, which is not the case anymore at all. Okay, so this is um, the first result I want to state. And so if you specialize this to the case D equals one, this gives you the result I've been promising about, promising you. If you have an ancient mean curvature flow um, and with a bound on its entropy, then it's contained in a Euclidean subspace where the dimension is bounded in terms of the entropy. Okay, so that's, this is the analog of that toy problem that we saw for shrinking curves. For shrinking curves, it was always bounded and it always was contained in something two dimensional. That's not true in general, but we can get a bound on the dimension and the dimension just depends on the entropy. Okay, so I'm, uh, let's see. I'm approaching the midway point of the talk. So this is where I go into hyper hyperspeed um, or, well, it would if I didn't, wasn't, I uh, use my strong willpower to stop from doing that. So let me may maybe just pick a few other results that I wanna highlight. Okay, so this is, a, all right, this is an interesting analytic result. It turns out these, these eigenfunctions, um, there's, we, we get some sort of polynomial growth in general. So as, let me just state that. Remember that these, uh, on Euclidean space, I told you that the eigenfunctions for this ornstein ollenbeck operator are uh, polynomials. We showed that if you have any shrinker at all, uh, then the eigenfunctions for the corresponding uh, drift Laplacian or ornstein ullenbeck operator always grow polynomially. Um, and the rate of growth is again, twice the eigenvalue. Okay, and so this, uh, right, so th this is surprising because we haven't assumed any curvature bound or anything. So to get a, uh, a soup estimate this strong without a curvature bound is, is, is unusual. Okay, then there's some eigenvalue counting problems. I'll skip that. And let me maybe just very briefly uh, talk about the, uh, the, the, the second main result that I wanna um, highlight, the second main direction here. And so this is this sharp version. And so, um, so what we prove is that if you have a shrinker, even in very high co-dimension, and there's on, on a, a compact set, it's close to a cylinder, uh, then in fact, the shrinker is a cylinder. So it's a very strong rigidity of the cylinder. So, yeah, hopefully that's clear as a statement. There are two steps to this, uh, to showing this. The first thing is that we show that if you have a, a shrinker, uh, even in high co-dimension, that's uh, close to a cylinder, then in fact, it has to be a hypersurface. And then we can reduce to the, the, the corresponding result for hypersurfaces which uh, Toby and I proved together with Tom Illman in, um, in 2015. Okay, so, so this thing that, uh, again, the hypersurface thing, you can guess how that might go. 
I've, you know, what we'll show is that in fact, the number of coordinate functions that are linearly independent is at most n plus one. Okay, now we show that not just for shrinkers, we actually show it for a, a wider class of ancient flows. Um, and the, the reason that uh, is, is of interest. Okay, so um, let me state there's so there's one theorem which is showing it for uh, uh, flows which are have a tangent flow that's cylindrical at minus infinity. And so the reason that this uh, that we were interested in this is this allows there's a, a number of um, results about flows in, in uh, co dimension one that are asymptotic to, to cylinders at minus infinity. And so these turn out to be uh, something that you can classify. So there are a number of examples constructed by Altschuler and Wu and also Brian and White, and then later also by Hasselhofer and Hershkowitz. And um, ancient flows with these properties have been classified by uh, Anganet, Daskalopoulos, and Sesam, Brendel Choi, and Choi, Hasselhofer, and Hershkowitz. And so when we combine with their classifications in co-dimension one, together with it, we show that um, these flows, we're able to show these flows actually really do live in a, in a they are co-dimension one in a subspace, uh, then we recover this, this structure theory, this classification. Okay, I can tell that that was a little fast. Okay, and so the last result that I want to very briefly mention is we're able in certain cases to get some bound uh, without even assuming an entropy bound. We're able to, to deduce an entropy bound and that's when, when things are uh, generic. So, so if you have a, a surface in high co-dimension and you know it's stable under perturbation. So this is a singularity that can't just be perturbed away. Um, then we're able to get a bound on the entropy. And once we have this, we get a bound for the co-dimension. And so this, uh, this is inspired you know, here uh, by some arguments, the old uh, Hirsch, Yang, Yao arguments and um, uh, yeah, by, by using complex analysis to construct uh, good test functions. Okay, I think I should stop there rather than risking out lasting my welcome here. So uh, please feel free with the uh, questions here. Thank you for the talk. Uh, any questions, comments? Um, I have a rather general question. So one of the motivating questions uh, uh, in the talk seem to be to try to understand uh, singularities of, uh, of minimal subvarieties in uh, what, what is the co-dimension expected to be and so forth. Um, to what degree can you hope to uh, actually get the general such object by taking the limit of a, uh, of a mean curvature flow? Uh, so in general, right, so usually, um, so if you were interested in minimal, um, then of course those are static solutions of the flow. Mm -hmm. And it's usually, it's usually rather easy from the minimal to construct a flow going to that. Uh, it's much, typically it's much harder to prove things about the flow than the minimal guy. Okay, so there are cases. So, you know, it's like, if you go back to the old Eel Sampson stuff, then the uh, harmonic maps, when they were born, were born to produce harmonic, uh, sorry, heat flow for harmonic maps was born to produce harmonic maps. Right. There are a few results in minimal surfaces where a mean curvature flow is used to produce a minimal guy. But as a general rule, the, uh, the mean curvature flow is much, much nastier. Mm -hmm. And so we, we don't, we typically don't, we look to the minimal for inspiration as opposed to, um, if I wanted to prove something about minimal, I would go right to minimal because I think it'd be easier. I see. So the 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 context, though, of, of the discussion is always that you're starting with a submanifold and then you're applying the, the flow. And right. the, the my question was how you know if you start off with some uh, minimal subvariety of some type, to what degree could that kind of singularity a priori arise from some limit of of a sequence of of submanifolds? So. Uh, Almost always, okay? So typically it's not hard to, to go to, if you have a minimal, you can find flows that go there. Uh -huh. Okay, so how easy it is to find the flow depends on the index of the minimal. 
Got it. So remember the minimal, those are like critical points. And so then if we want to understand the dynamics nearby, we need to think about the Hessian of the critical point. Right. So the unstable ones uh, if, if are more and more, the more unstable it is, the more difficult it is to get there. Uh, the more stable it is, then the, the easier it is to get there. And in fact, if you have something that's strictly stable, then if you start with anything nearby, it's going to, with probability one, end up there. Okay, so, uh, right. So let me see. So, I, so one example, for instance, this is, a, this is a cute problem. If you have, suppose you, you have, um, let's do curve shortening flow in the sphere, the round sphere. So we could still have the, uh, the Grayson type situation where we disappear at a round point, Grayson gauge Hamilton. But we also have a new possibility that we could end up at an equator. Right. Um, and in fact, with probability one, you'll disappear at a point. So it, it's easy to see that uh, using the, the Gauss-Binet that um, if the area is divided exactly in half, then that will be preserved. If the area is not exactly in half, then it gets worse. It gets further from being half. And so you, you end up, and so in, in that case, if it's, if, if, if it's not exactly half, you disappear at a point. If it's half, you end up at an equator. I see. And so there's something like that that goes on in general. And that, again, the reason it was co-dimension, so, so in that case, we think it's like with the things that end up at the equator are co-dimension one. And so that corresponds to the equator being index one. Mm -hmm as a critical point. We'd love to have a theory like that in greater generality, but uh, at this point, nothing like that really exists. What can be done is, is the flow can be analyzed, say in a tubular neighborhood of a minimal guy. I'm busy. <laughs> yeah, hi, Bill. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, if you're in a situation where you understand uh, this, this, all the singularities um, sufficiently well, um, are you able to consider uh, a surgery process and uh, continue the flow through uh, by doing surgery and looking at uh, long time limits? Uh, great question. Uh, that is at this point well beyond uh, our, our capability. Huh. Huh. Okay, so. Uh, Right, so people have managed to, to do surgery in some cases, uh, notably, you know, the two convex case, yeah. and then uh, Brendel and Huiskin did it in the, in the mean convex case in, in R3, uh, yeah. and, and there are some results along that line, but, but beyond that, uh, really not. It's not yet, it's not anywhere near the, the, the state of, say, uh, you know, Ritchie flow in three dimensions. Oh, wow, wow. What, what, are, what are some of the difficulties? One of the, diff uh, right, so there, uh, yeah, right. So there are a number of difficulties. So first of all, even having a canon canonical neighborhood theorem. Oh. So there is a canonical neighborhood theorem, uh, it, say in R3, if you know that the, the singularities are all mean convex. And so that's one reason why uh, mean, you know, you're able to, to do something there. But in, in, in general, we don't even have that. Oh, okay. There, there are too many, okay, so there's several problems. First of all, too many singularities. Okay, so uh, for, for Ritchie flow in say three dimensions, it's a very short list. Yeah, yeah. Right? Um, and, and so it tends, to, it tends to go like one dimension higher. So there are a lot of formal sim sim similarities between Ritchie flow on surfaces and curve shortening flow. Uh, and then when, once you go to um, Ritchie flow in three dimensions, that, then it's, it, it, it's a bit like um, mean huh. curvature flow for surfaces. And so there in the mean convex cases, qu quite a bit you can do. Once you get any higher than that, then it's really like high, high, high dimension Ritchie flow. And right. then you better make some pretty strong assumptions if you want to prove something. Right. Interesting. There's actually, there's some logic to it because uh, when you understand the mean curvature flow, it's, it's, of course, you could use that to understand the topology of the space. Right. But it also is implicitly giving you not just the topology of the space, but the, uh, the topology of the space of submanifolds of the space. Right. Right. And so that's like one extra level of complexity right, right. there. Right. I mean, obviously, you. it's heuristic. But, you know. Thank you. Yep. Beautiful talk. Thanks right. very Thanks. much. Thanks. Let me stop sharing here. Okay, then. Uh, thank you again if there are no more questions. Thanks. Great talk. Right, thank you. Uh, where's dinner? <laughs> <laughs>